Hey everyone, hello and welcome to this Gamer Camp podcast. Gamer Camp is a festival held in Toronto every year that celebrates the art and creativity in video games. My name is Mark Rabo, I'm one of the co-founders of Gamer Camp. And what you're about to hear is a keynote presentation by a trio of creative minds behind the upcoming title Sword and Sorcery. The guys are Chris Piotrowski, who is creative director and game designer at Capybara Games, Jim Guthrie, who is a musician and composer and whose lovely music you're listening to in the background right now, and Craig D. Adams, who's a representative of Super Brothers Incorporated. Uh, this recording was taken on November 13th, which was the first day of Gamer Camp and um, features some stories and philosophies and inspirations that were behind this game and its creation. So I hope you enjoy it and I'll catch you at the end. Welcome to uh, Gamer Camp. Thank you, Jamie and Mark. Uh, Sword and Sorcery, you got to really pronounce the extra W. And uh, the talk is kind of, you know, we subtitled it Aiming for Audiovisual Alchemy, because what we're going to kind of talk about is, is how we uh, sort of mix and match our various strengths and abilities and try to construct something kind of neat. Before we get to that, though, I'll just kind of outline, um, you know, what the project is and where it came from, because where it's coming from is kind of unique, and I think it's something that, uh, you know, could really only happen in this city uh, with these people. So uh, a little while ago, about a year ago actually, right after the last Gamer Camp, uh, we announced the project with, uh, with this visual and this beautiful, beautiful music of gems. So we got some nice music, we got some nice pixels, now we got to make a game. Uh, this is a collaborative project made right here in Toronto. Uh, the IO Cinema is the pixels, that's by a company called Super Brothers, which is also based here in Toronto, uh, ambiguously pluralized. And the sounds and music are by this man over here, Jim Gaffrey. That theme actually plays every time he enters a room. It's amazing. <laughs> and then uh, the, the kind of the, the, the main collaborator here is uh, Cappy Bar Games, and this is Chris Piotrowski, who's the creative director there. Um, Cappy is basically the reason the project exists. Uh, that's where the programmers are. That's where the design experience is, and that's where it's all taking place. Actually, about a hundred yards away from where we are now is their offices. Um, the game is for iPad, iPhone, and iPod Touch. And uh, when will it be released? Uh, soon, real soon. Uh, we're serious this time, real soon. Um, stay tuned. Uh, and swordandsorcery.com is where you can uh, find out all about it if you're so, mu so interested. So, uh, yeah, let's get into it. This is the backstory here. Um, I'm from out west, uh, and I grew up on Commodore 64. I think it's the best system ever. Um, and in those days, there were these pioneering games that didn't have a genre, they didn't have uh, conventions, they were just completely uh, out there. And they were all about just digging in and exploring and trying to figure out uh, how they worked. Um, I, I love these things. This stuff was hugely inspirational to me. Obviously, the NES came out, and there's a game that you guys might have heard of. It's called Super Mario Brothers. And uh, that was taking the craft to a whole new level. Uh, apologies for that. And, uh, and Metroid, these kinds of games. Um, you were seeing games like this these days, but there, there was kind of a time when people weren't going in this direction. You know, if you think of how different modern games are with all their tutorials and all the, you know, production values and cinematic stuff, uh, it's so different than the kind of craft that went into these. Um, and I kind of miss it. Anyway, I came out here to Toronto, which is what Toronto looks like when it's on fire, by the way. <laughs> and uh, I went to art school, and I learned how to do that stuff. But I always wanted to basically make the games that I grew up on. Um, this is a picture from Jordan Metzner's Prince of Persia, which is a huge inspiration. Um, and so I was introduced to pixel art at some point, um, actually by the programmer on Sword and Sorcery back in like 03 or 02 or something. Um, and I kind of started going in this direction. Um, I, was, I was trained as an illustrator, so I started getting into a couple magazines here and there. And that was, 
that was a real victory, uh, getting these kinds of things in like legitimate actual publications that actual people read kind of felt like a victory for our generation. Anyways, um, and then I created this brand called Super Brothers, um, which was basically just defined by the style that you just saw and by the goal of trying to make something that has a soul. Um, the thing is, I have no soul, so it was actually really hard. Um, <laughs> but uh, thankfully, th uh, that's where Jim c uh, comes into the picture. Um, basically, uh, apologies for the weird sound there, but uh, Jim makes some phenomenal records. This is Morning, Noon, Night, which uh, unfortunately my headphone jack is kind of murdering right now. Uh, hmm. Here's some other beautiful work by Jim. That's uh, uh, Royal City, uh, Alone at the Microphone. Phenomenal record. Uh, I think it got a, got a Juno, I'm pretty sure. Uh, now More Than Ever, phenomenal record as well. Uh, really wonderful stuff. Um, I've been listening to him for years and was a huge fan. Um, and then I found out uh, that he was uh, also kind of a nerd. Um, turns out that uh, on Morning, Noon, Night and a few of his other records, he was using something called the... Uh, Whoa, PlayStation uh, MTV Music Generator for yeah for the original PS1. This was at a time when uh, you know a few years ago where it wasn't that easy to just scare up a laptop. So a PS1 with a like basic sequencer was a pretty good way to start making uh, all different kinds of music. So Jim would use it as like a backing track, a drum track, whatever. Um, and he started constructing just really amazing compositions in this in this environment. That's kind of what it looks like there. Um, using the game controller, like using the PlayStation controller to make these like symphonies happen. Really beautiful stuff. And uh, and then Jim sent me basically a, a, an entire record of just these PlayStation compositions, and it blew my mind. And it was the biggest thing that had happened. And um, one of the songs, this one here, um, Jim took a single guitar note and then replicated it a hundred zillion times and turned it into this song called Children of the Clone. I got that, and I never animated or made a music video, but I figured, man, what the hell, I can see it. it can't be that hard. Let's just make a stick man walk. Anyway, this was a big deal for me because it was the first time that uh, the pixels had a soul and had a, a life to them, and it was all just because Jim's song rocks, and I just had to wrap the visuals around it. I'll just play this for like, like 10 seconds here. song goes on like that until someone's brutally murdered. What kind of head to that? Here we go. Sorry for the spoiler. Anyway, so that was, uh, that, that, that was, that was the, uh, that was a big deal, working with Jim, uh, who's, you know, I'm a huge fan of. Um, the thing is, is, you know, a few years ago, something like indie video games was a term, didn't even really exist, um, and I really wanted to make video games, so I figured that I needed to go and um, make 3D models of people with guns shooting each other and uh, stuff like that. Um, and then I joined the industry where we made wonderful things about flying cars and people murdering each other. And, uh, and the industry, I mean, they make wonderful, there's wonderful games that are made out there, but the trick is when you go into that machinery, um, the projects get bigger because the production values have to be higher and then the risk goes down and so people aren't doing as much interesting things, which is why uh, it's a real blessing that in the last like five or six years um, there's been this incredible resurgence of, uh, of, of small creators, small studios exploring new ground. And Toronto, for whatever reason, happens to be like leading the pack there with some incredible people. Um, and this played a big part in, in my whole story, is basically when I was in the industry, I was looking at all this and realizing I needed to get out. This is. Um, N Plus by uh, Mayor Shepard and Reagan Burns, who are from here in Toronto. This is the first indie game I think I'd ever heard of um, back in like 03 or 04. Um, this is Everyday Shooter by John Mack, which is a hugely inspiring game. One dude uh, making the whole thing. It's basically like an album of musical shooters. That, just the fact that that's a, a subtitle, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful thing as well. Jim Monroe is one of the guys who's just ever present in the scene in Toronto. He writes uh, text adventures as well as uh, writing books and comics. And he's also just been organizing um, and bringing people together for the last few years. Um, uh, amazing guy. He also runs something called the Artsy Games Incubator, which is a way for people who don't know how to make games but are kind of interested to get, get their feet wet with it. And a guy who runs the Artsy Games Incubator the last little while is Miguel Sternberg, uh, who makes phenomenal games. This one is a real favorite of mine. 
Night of the Cephalopods, definitely check it out. Um, Benjamin Rivers, uh, another awesome friend of mine, he's making great stuff. He went to the AGI, he went to Toe Jam. Jim McGinley, uh, Jim McGinley runs Toe Jam along with M and a few other people. Michael Todd, I worked with this guy. Uh, my first indie project was a Toe Jam project and we made this crazy zombie game. Michael's ended up making a series of w wicked, super stylish games. If you guys don't know about Toe Jam, uh, it's a, you know, two days of the year. Uh, everybody gets together and over the course of like two days they make uh, phenomenal games. It's so ins inspiring. And then there's the Hand-Eye Society, which has been going for like a year and a bit. If you don't know about it, Google it, join it, come on out. It's a really good time. Um, and they're doing some wonderful stuff. And then Gamer Camp, which has just showed up on the scene last year. This is the second year, and I hope it's going to be a, an institution that lasts because it's a, it's a great thing. Um, anyway, so back to this little story of mine. Uh, I'll get through it real quick. So yeah, great indie stuff going on. Here I am in the industry, but but like, what's the actual next step? Like, what's like? I need a miracle, basically. I need I need to find someone to collaborate with, um, who has got the same goals as me, um, and and would actually take a risk on somebody who actually hasn't made a game yet. It seems kind of like an impossible proposition. <laughs> that's when that happened. So I ran into these guys. That's Nathan Vella. He's the president of Cappy, and that's. Uh, Chris Piotrowski right here and these guys saved my life these guys are they they stepped in and they saw what I'd done with Jim and they said hey we should make a game and I said okay <laughs> and that's how that happened um, and they run uh, Cappy and uh, Cappy is a phenomenal company that made uh, Critter Crunch for PSN totally beautiful uh, definitely worth checking out and uh, they made Clash of Heroes as well for DS, which is about to be released on the big boy consoles, and it's, it's looking phenomenal. Um, and so yeah, me and Jim, Cappy and Super Brothers, uh, this is the team, there's five of us basically uh, full time on it. There's me doing some pixels. Uh, Chris is doing uh, design supervision, leading the project through uh, overcoming obstacles, helping solve problems. Jim is obviously uh, involved creatively and doing a lot of the, uh, the, well, all the music and a lot of the sound. John Maurer is the guy who introduced me to Pixels way back in the day, and he's kind of the senior programmer on the project. And Frankie is a programmer at Cappy who does a lot of heavy lifting, a lot of the gameplay programming, and these guys have been working a ton over the last year. And uh, anyway, these are, this is them. And uh, originally the game was known as Poop Sock. I thought that was a really wicked name for an iPhone game. Um, but we had to actually submit a grant application and we figured the government wouldn't think it was that funny. And originally it was gonna be, uh, it was gonna be kinda like this. It was gonna be real simple. Just like a like goofy little RPG kinda deal. Yeah, so that kind of thing. The thing is, 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 as we got into it, we realized that it's like, well, why restrict ourselves to something so small when we could sort of explore a little bit? And, uh, and, and, and you know, why make something, like I don't actually play RPGs, and neither does uh, Jim, so why try to make something that's kind of outside of what's, what's exciting for us? And actually it was Chris kind of leading us along that kind of helped us get onto a more positive track, something we were actually more passionate about. And, uh, you know, when we look back to the classics, Stuff like that, adventure. This is way back in the day, um, and yeah, we tried. We wanted to make something that had a little bit of the old, uh, the old Zelda magic, something that's kind of exploration themed. And we came up with this. Um, Chris and I sitting down, working on a logo, uh, adding the W to sorcery, and then realizing that that was hilarious. Um, the other big uh, part of it is that so we named it Sword and Sorcery, but I actually didn't know anything about Sword and Sorcery as a genre, so I kind of dug into it a little bit, and it all goes back to this guy. That's a, a Robert E. Howard in Texas uh, at the age of like 11, dressed as an Indian. Um, he would uh, grow up uh, and in the 1930s uh, he would come up with Conan the Barbarian. Um, and it's these stories that, uh, this is where the, the term sword and sorcery comes from. And I never actually read too much of this or, or knew too much about it. I mean, I love the Schwarzenegger picture, but that's about it. But as I dug, it, I dug into it, it just got more and more interesting. Um, sort of psychologically, like what, what's going on in the guy's imagination uh, that he's dreaming this kind of stuff up? Like it's so, 
is so primeval, it goes way back, but there's something very specific about, about this type of imagination that that gets the reason it's still popular. And I started thinking about the psychology of this, and we kind of looked to Carl Jung, and, uh, and, and Chris uh, linked me this, that there's, um, Carl Jung wrote this crazy book uh, that has, like, those are illustrations by Carl Jung of, like, a dude slaying a dragon and, like, magical, like, trees in the forest. Um, and Jung's, a, you know, he's a, a psychologist who talks a lot about archetypes and how we all have the same drives and the same imaginings no matter where, where we are in the world. And there's something about that and the genre of sword and sorcery that, that fits. No matter where we are, no matter how sophisticated we are, um, we still just love the idea of like a magical sword and going into a dark cave to fight a dragon. So that's kind of the concept there. Carl Jung, Conan the Barbarian, um, turned into this. So when we, st when we got going, it was just a matter of taking music that Jim already had, some, some of the music he already had, and then just trying to wrap visuals around it that would get it across and it was just this idea of trying to get this kind of alchemy happening so that it felt like the concept and the music and the art were all one thing. This was an early animatic back in the day. It's kind of stream of consciousness and, and weird. Chopping rainbows. Oh, if you're sensitive, look away. Oh, it's too late. <laughs> All right, so we're getting to the we're getting to the main stuff here. So now we're going to show some footage from the game. Some of it you've seen online. Some of it I know is uh, is new. And we're just going to talk a little bit about um, how this stuff actually came to be. And I'm going to start, and then I'm going to pass it over here a little bit. Um, so when we started, it was the idea of like let's try to tell a, a, a game or present a game that doesn't have all the usual trappings, that doesn't have story in a, in a normal way, that does most of its talking through the music or through the art. Um, and, you know, Super Mario Brothers is kind of uh, pretty amazing for that. Um, early in the project, we were rewarded with uh, a, a IGF Achievement in Art Award, which was great. It was like this, we worked for 30 days and submitted something, and we managed to get, get in. Um, <laughs> which felt great, but then we had to go to GDC to show how our, our awesome game, and so we had to actually come up with something more substantial to show. This was back in, like, January, February. Um, Jim had this beautiful song from back in the day that I'd had on that first record that he gave me. Sounds like this. Sounds like that. It's a stunner. Um, and I'd always wanted to make a music video of this, but the program that I use doesn't actually have backgrounds. So um, it took this project to actually try to make the music video version. Of it. And uh, I made this animatic. So this is what it looks like when someone who can't program tries to show what a game would be like using the equivalent of paper cutouts. Wait for it. Wait for it. I'm actually confused. There should be some... So the, the story it is, how, how do you try to communicate a vision when you can't program it? Well, this is the answer. You get little pictures and you move them, and you play music over top. And what I did is I took Jim's song and I tried to make a room that matched every phrase in the song. bunch more work and ended up looking like this. I like chilled out openings. 
part of the idea that's going on here is that I love a game that doesn't have to explain itself with a tutorial, and that you can just figure it out by poking and prodding it. I also really like the idea of taking Robert E. Howard's like epic, action-packed, monster-killing mayhem, um, and then starting it off with uh, the most gentle, chilled-out sequence imaginable. We still have like uh, wolves and skeletons and demons that live in the dungeon, but uh, I feel like like having the opposite in there as well kind of enriches both. Another concept that was really important was the idea of making a record that you could walk through. And there is a game that you, you get involved with, uh, and you'll see some of that. But before that happens, it's just a place that you can go visit. If you imagine, like, you've got your iPhone, your iPad, you just want, you want a record that you can hang out in. And that's kind of what I think we're starting to accomplish here. This is a cool scene. That's Jim. You'll hear him uh, play a song. You're in this kind of quiet, intimate little place. Our audio levels are a little bit mixed up right now. Anyway, this is the kind of stuff that uh, that I remember from the Commodore days. This like sense of mystery. Um, you know, you can see the moon in the background there. If you were to play this game during the full moon, uh, the moon would be full and the scene would be a little bit different. If you play it during the dark moon, Jim won't be there. He'll be somewhere else in the forest delivering a concert. So there's these kinds of little mysterious ideas that we kind of are trying to worm into all the rooms and in the story. Um, and it's actually, it's kind of working out. It's, it's kind of pretty. Anyway, I'm going to turn it over and we're going to look at uh, something called sorcery. Yeah, I'll going. So this is uh, uh, one of the things that we talked about when we were starting the project was how we were going to try to bring like a musical s gameplay to the game. And we figured it would happen through sorcery. So uh, the game is called Sword and Sorcery. You do use a sword, you do like hack and slash some dudes. Um, but the sorcery is a little bit more nebulous and usually in games it's like it comes down to like using a magic spell to hit a guy in the face or something. We wanted to try something a little bit different. Um, so we invented these little dudes. They're like space babies. Um, and they're weird and, and you sort of wander through the forest and come across them. And we wanted to like, figure out ways <laughs> We wanted to figure out ways for, for you to just discover this like magical musical reality that kind of is in all the woods and in all the creeks and in all the ponds. This is a song that Jim made for the Space Babies. It's called The Ballad of the Space Babies. It's so beautiful. Uh, so next I'm just going to show some footage of what it's like to actually interact with the Space Baby, in case you were wondering. Um, <laughs> Hello.
Yeah, so at some point in the game, you actually uh, get access to um, sorcery. And um, as Craig was saying, it kind of reveals a whole different sort of element to the game environments. Um, so the kind of main idea was that we wanted to sort of uh, accentuate certain details that Craig already had in the environments with musical elements. Um, and yeah, at one point you do go on this sort of uh, hunt for these little space babies, and you search for them with sorcery. So right now you just saw the character go into sorcery mode, and uh, it takes a little bit of exploration and um, leaps of faith to sort of find uh, the little melodies hidden inside the environments. So I'll just let it play out and hope the audio works. <laughs> screen <laughs> but we got him so just like everything with uh, in the game Ooh, um, this is sort of one of the moments where uh, we're trying to sort of merge uh, the gameplay and the audio experience with the visual experience and kind of create this sort of single kind of experience that, that uh, is really unique and, and, and soulful. And, you know, it's filled with these little tiny moments for you to discover. Um, that's about it. Pass it over to Jim. So we're sharing some of the kind of quieter moments because they're pretty special and we think that uh, it's something that, that feels really nice on the device. But not every moment in the game is, uh, is subtle and, and quiet like that. Um, the next clip, uh, which will be the last clip that we show, is, uh, is one that I will just kind of give you a sense as to what it's been like for Jim to uh, be creating music for the game. So we'll just move ahead, scoring a video game. So uh, we're going to show you this clip where this is kind of early in the game. It's kind of more of a straightforward adventure where you're cruising up a mountain and about to enter a cave. Um, there was the main song for going up the, the hill. is something that Jim had from before. It was a beautiful song he made on PlayStation. And it just always sounded to me like dudes going on an adventure uh, and, and, and fighting wolves or something. So that was a song that, that existed before. Um, and then I painted the uh, sequence and put the song over top. And then we kind of cut the song up and rearranged it in, in various ways so that it was adaptive. Um, and then another example is uh, once you get up to the mountain, you go in and the mood changes entirely. And we needed a song that was going to be um, is suspenseful, basically a like total tonal chif uh, shift. So I'll just pass it over to Jim. He can uh, talk a little bit about what that, what that entailed. Um, I'm not even sure where, where we're starting, but um, uh, this is like the scary sort of cave music that I had to make, and um, 
This is my first game, uh, and this is like the coolest thing that I've ever worked on. Um, but we all don't really sort of know what we're doing a lot of the time, and I think you sort of have to expect that when you're making a game. Sometimes you're just sort of working to, you know, uh, figure out what it is you're working on. Um, so I just sort of wanted to show this scene in the sense that um, we had this uh, cave scene, and there's a scene that we'll show after this um, where you walk into the cave. And when I did this music, all I really had uh, was a bunch of emails from Craig. Um, I hadn't even really seen a lot of this artwork. Um, but we knew that we needed something scary and sort of sinister um, as you walked into this part of the game. Um, so I came up with this music. Um, and maybe we'll just watch a bit of it here. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll also say, you know, um, one of my favorite things about working on the game is, yeah, that we don't really know what we're making, but we sort of know the, uh, like the vibe and the spirit of the game, and that's what leads us. And it's, you know, it's, um, it's like writing a song, I guess. Like this video game is a song to me, one big song, uh, in the sense that, like, you can get a, you know, you can get like a feeling, um, and you don't have all the words yet. You may not have the melody, but uh, you just sort of trust the vibe and trust the feeling. Uh, and you and you just move forward um, and these guys are great to work with so it's uh, really easy to sort of uh, not know what you're doing but still sort of feel like you're making something um, really beautiful yeah so we'll maybe stop it here before something really scary happens Alright, so we're going to show one last little clip, uh, which is early in the game, and uh, you'll get a sense as to the vibe of it, and you'll also hear that music we were just listening to uh, used in, in, when the cave opens. It's kind of a nice touch. It's just part of this weird patchwork that we're making. <laughs> It gets really dark in this game. Mm -hmm. All right. 
We're going to leave it there. That's pretty much the presentation. We hope you enjoyed it, and I don't know if there's time, but we can take a couple questions maybe. Um, thanks very much. So if anybody has any questions, uh, raise your hand. Um, one way in there. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe you can yell it out and I'll just repeat it. So the, hold on. The question is about a fighting mechanic. Um, so I'll let you... Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, uh, there is a significant amount of uh, battling wolves and skeletons and naked bears and uh, triangles and things like that. Um, we, we chose to, uh, to focus on this sort of weird, mysterious stuff because um, there's no shortage of fighting um, games out there, and, and we just felt like, like this was sort of a better way to look at that. But definitely uh, fighting is, like, that's the sword part of sorcery. And, uh, and it does come up here and there, and, and hopefully you'll experience it in the game. It's pretty cool. I actually have a, a question of my own. Um, you, guys, you guys won a lot of, um, you guys won some IGF awards for art achievement um, this year, and, um, and the game is coming out only for the iPhone and the, and the iPad. And uh, my question is, what, what made you decide to, to put that art onto the small screen as opposed to going bigger? And, um, and how do you find that that changes the experience uh, for the player? Uh, bigger screen means a lot more art. And uh, when we had it on iPhone, uh, it, was, it was really sharp and lots of, uh, lots of detail. And then you blow it up to iPad and it still looks good. But uh, you've got to add a lot more art to make it look, look better. And if you were to scale up to uh, a display on a like, desktop, man, it would just take that much more pixels uh, to fill the whole thing up. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, but uh, we chose for the small devices because it just seemed like a game that you wanted to have in your hand. And actually, it, it, as much as the iPad version looks really, really nice and it's great to have it that big, um, it's still really, really special on the smaller device. Um, it, just, it, it just seems like a nice little microscopic world and it's kind of cool for that. I have a bunch of questions, but I won't hog it too much. Hi there. Uh, do you have a release date yet? There's a lot of running for a short question. <laughs> um, one of the things I wanted to ask about, uh, which is kind of interesting um, to me and uh, and I think maybe some other people too, is um, is you talk about the interactive cinema, right? The I/O cinema. Um, and kind of, I guess, tr traditional cinema isn't interactive at all. It's sort of a one-way, a one-way um, medium. So, how do you, how do you kind of think of, uh, is it like a merging of those two things that you're uh, that you're looking at? And how does the interactivity change the experience of uh, of the storytelling? Yeah. So I made up a term called input-output cinema, and uh, because it sounded really funny, and also it helped describe what I, I thought was cool about games. Um, there are great games about skill and uh, challenge and things like that, but actually what appeals to me most um, is just working out what the game is about by sort of poking and prodding at it like I did with the old Commodore games. Um, and so input-output cinema as a term, that, that's, that's what that is to me. It's, it's you poking and prodding at something in order to understand it, and then the way it's presented to you is sort of cinematic or it uses the kind of lighting and sound that, that cinema uses. Um, but yeah, when you add interactivity to cinema, I mean, it it, it becomes a totally different beast. Um, it, you know, this really what the, what in, in put output cinema is is just a, a video game that's uh, easy on the challenge, uh, easy on the ability to use it. Like the input is very simple; anybody can do it. Um, and then the reward is that there's just something interesting about it that keeps you coming back, or there's just enough craft or character, just like in, in a film. You know, a film doesn't have to be challenging to watch. It doesn't have to be uh, full of action. It just has to be interesting and, and well told. And 
Uh, I think that there is space for that in, the, in, in video games, and, and I, I think there might even be an audience for it. Um, but I certainly hope there is. So the question is, how do you how do you get um, feedback on a game that's uh, kind of in uncharted territory? Yeah. Uh, I'll pass it on. All right. uh, that's a good question. I, I don't have a lot of experience with this. All I know is that there's like a like a vision I'm trying to chase down, but not having the sort of chops and the design experience, it is not easy to get to where you're going. And that's where someone like. Uh, like this guy Chris comes in. Um, we all have like a gut instinct and an intuition and we all can sort of feel when something's moving in the right direction or when it's moving in the wrong direction. Um, but Chris having spent a lot of years making games also knows how, like, how to prioritize and how to kind of get back on track. Do you have something? Sure. Um, well, uh, yeah, I was just going to say that um, I think that most people on the project are um, crazy critical people that uh, so there's a lot of uh, you know self uh, criticizing and all that kind of stuff so I think uh, mostly a lot of it comes from us just kind of being honest with our own work and sort of uh, you know not letting um, you know not feeling that like everything's great and really kind of tackling the stuff that uh, that actually stands out but then on top of that the sort of general environment at Cappy uh, Nathan's here as well we we sort of um, we can't help it like we just uh, pick apart everything all the time, um, and then after at a certain point, we um, when the game sort of starts to crystallize, uh, that's when we sort of start to show it to other people. Um, so with uh, with this game, it's it's taken a long time to sort of figure out what the game um, actually is, um, and we're just sort of started getting to the point where we're actually kind of letting people play with play with it, and and uh, and we do take their feedback as well, but. Yeah, I think it's very important to not get any feedback from anybody um, for as long as possible so that you can actually realize uh, uh, your vision without worrying about, you know, someone not getting something that you already know doesn't work anyway. So, um, yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's important to just be super critical yourself for a long time and then release it. How are we doing for time? Five minutes? Um, okay. The question is, did you draw stills and then have it anim animated, or did you painstakingly uh, do it yourself? There's a machine at Cappy, and all you do is you uh, tell the machine what art you want, and it just spits it out. Um, so, I mean, I went into the office early in the project, just told the machine a bunch of things, uh, and then traveled the world. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, the painstaking one. So... Um, <laughs> uh, so what happens is like uh, because the systems we're working with are, are powerful enough that we can just yeah we can just paint a whole background. Um, so a lot of these things are, are just laborious paintings. But I'm you know I'm stamping a lot of things. Like you see the same bush a lot of different places. You know similar trees that kind of thing. Um, and yeah I'm putting all that in and then I'm adding elements like adding the waterfalls and adding the shrubs and adding the trees and all those kinds of things um, using a sort of a a rudimentary editor that we have, um, and then for the animating, it's it's yeah, uh, animating everything uh, frame by frame, and then getting the uh, programmers to sync it all up. Um, and there's a there's a heck of a lot of pixels in the game, and it has been a lot of painting and a lot of animating. And I'm not actually an animator, so uh, I just kind of flail around until it doesn't look too bad, and, uh, and so that takes time as well. But um, but the upshot, the upshot is like previously, uh, when people were making games, they would be making tile sets, like the old 8-bit games, and that, you know, that's really powerful. You can do a lot with that. Um, but with uh, the modern technology, there's just no real boundaries, and so you can just come up with any uh, any way of making the game and see if it works. Um, and yeah, this is the strategy that we employed here. Yeah. 
Uh, and the animation is all motion captured. Um, I had a question uh, about the music uh, for Jim. Uh, you come from kind of like a you come from like a traditional uh, singer. You're like a singer songwriter. You were in bands. Um, you do some like commercial compositional stuff. You said this was your first game. Um, what's what was it like kind of getting uh, working on this project, and how is it different from the way that you've been? Uh, you know, how you've written and come up with music uh, in the past? Um, I'd say um, when you score like a film, I, um, I've also done like a lot of ad work and, and some, you know, films and friends films. Um, when you score that stuff, you just sort of know how it's going to go. You can see, you know, like the whole film or the whole ad and you can see it from start to finish. But when you do a game, you don't really know uh, what the player's going to do, and I found that the most challenging to sort of try and write music, because we don't want it just to be like wallpaper music all the time. I guess um, it's sort of adaptive at times, and um, you know, it's always doing something. So I guess, yeah, I, like I think it's the ultimate challenge to do, you know, to score a game, is I think, because um, you don't always know what the player's going to do, so you sort of want the experience to be cool no matter what they do. Um, and I found that that like really tough. But I've been lucky because I've had a lot of music written already, so I basically have to output the music in sort of ways that Craig uh, can animate, you know. And and then um, it's really a conversation too that we have, you know. It's uh, we don't, yeah. Sometimes we have no idea how we're going to get there, but we just keep on poking. So. Yeah, one of the weird. Um, I don't know if it's a pleasure or something, but. Um, Jim will give me a, like a beautiful piece of music, um, but I need, it, I need the first part of the music to loop, and I need the last part of the music to loop, and then I need like a special ending. And so to illustrate that point, I'll go and uh, chop Jim's music into ribbons, um, and then ram it in the game. And then I'll be like, what do you think? And he'll be like, ah, I think I see what you're going for. Ah. Um, so there's been a lot of that, uh, but we've sort of figured out how that works, and yeah, it is uh, absolutely a conversation. Uh, I, I figure out what I think is going to fit, and then Jimmy hears that and kind of processes it, and then comes up with a way better solution that makes it magical. Take one more question from... No more questions. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you guys for, for presenting and showing us what you're doing. Hey guys, it's Mark again. Hope you enjoyed that behind the scenes look into Sword and Sorcery. If you want to know more about the game, check out swordandsorcery.com. That's sorcery spelt with a W. And that podcast was filmed live at the 2010 edition of Gamer Camp held in Toronto, Canada on November 13th. In addition to speakers, actually, we had a ton of demos, a bunch of panels, some really cool competitions, retro consoles, indie arcades uh, from our local guys here in the city, and a giant pajama cereal breakfast complete with cartoons. Um, if you want to check out some pictures or learn more about the festival, uh, log on to gamercamp.ca. Um, we'll also be posting more podcasts of some of our talks, so uh, stay tuned to that, or follow us on Twitter at GamerCamp. I'm Mark Rabo, and on behalf of Jamie Wu, my co-organizer, thanks so much for listening, and uh, I'll talk to you soon.